I'm Kerry Lutz on 1230 WBZT. Well, it's Thanksgiving time. End of the year is near. And we've got a special interview for you with none other than Martin Armstrong. If you remember the last uh, interview we had, I think it was back towards the end of August, beginning of September, Martin made the outlandish, some would say outrageous call that sometime uh, in October, the Dow would break 16,000. Well, apologies extended. It took until till the third week of November. The Dow did break 16,000. He's sticking to his call, Dow 32,000 in 2015, and he's here with us now. Martin, welcome back. Oh, thank you for inviting me. Hey, so it, it did it. It happened just like you said. There were a lot of naysayers that said, I mean, I can't tell you how many columns, how many guests I had on that said that the, uh, that the stock market was peaking, it couldn't go any further because earnings are just horrible, and the stock market trades on the basis of earnings, so how much further it could, can it really go? And here we are, it's over 16,000, and it doesn't look like it's going to look back. Why is the market going higher here? Because it, you know, we're looking at the market, and I've been saying this, <laughs> It's largely since 2011, um, that what you're looking at is that it's, a, it's an international capital market right now. And you have tremendous problems in Europe and Japan and, and elsewhere. So with interest rates as low as they are, it's got nothing to do with earnings at this point. You have a lot of people moving capital into equities. You've got pension funds that need 8% just simply to break even, to become solvent. And in Europe, you have the IMF running around saying that the solution is to just confiscate 10% of everybody's assets. You have money pouring in Europe out into equities, real estate. In fact, we're coming out with a special report on this and with the projections out into into 15, you have uh, the Case Shiller index is is up on average 13 percent year over year. Um, in some areas like uh, Las Vegas, hit 29 percent, and we have real estate booming in London, um, in Europe, and in Asia. And it's starting here as well, too. And it's the top end. It's not the old, you know, you know, bottom end uh, stuff that we saw in, in 2007. But with the sovereign debt crisis coming on, and uh, Europe is just literally a basket case, the politicians, instead of fixing the system, which is they really have to re completely restructure the euro. Um, they're just putting band-aids on a failed system that they created. Um, you have all the banks had to have reserves, and to be politically correct, they had to have a piece of everybody's debt, but then you have a whole bunch of these sovereign governments defaulting. From Greece, Spain, Italy, you know, it's and they they all have problems, and then the banks start to go down, and then people say, "Oh, gee, why are the banks going down? Uh, because you forced them to buy government debt that's not worth anything." <laughs> so, it they don't fix the system; they just keep putting band aids on top of everything that they've done, and it just gets worse and worse and worse. Um, the wounds have got to be stitched up. It, it, this is the way it is. And so the stock market at the extreme has the potential here to, to, to double. Uh, we could see as high as that 32,000 level. At minimum, I would say you're going to see in probably in the mid-20s. Uh, it depends more on timing. The timing will be uh, 15, but... 
we're at a stage in the game of of really capital preservation, and that's what this is about. It's not really a demand led boom. This is is currency, and it all has has to do with trying just trying to preserve. Uh, all the pension funds are really pretty bad. I mean, I I look at a few of them. Um, talked to, to some, and I mean, some have been buying high yielding emerging market debt just to try and catch up. <laughs> yeah, it's become like a big crapshoot, huh? Well, you know, you can't keep interest rates uh, largely at these levels. And Expect things to actually be normal. You wipe out all the all the pensioners. Uh, you wipe out pension funds. The elderly have no money to spend. Uh, it's crazy. They they only look at one side of the coin. And, and I just put on our site this morning. Uh, a lot of people were saying, "Oh, you know, QE's got to be inflationary, etc." You get 3.6 trillion in reserves in China. So a lot of the money went out of the country. It didn't stay domestically. Domestically, uh, they created excess reserves. Now, I go through this on our site this morning because uh, a lot of people weren't even aware of this. The banks have $2.3 trillion in excess reserves. Uh, that's money that should have been lent into the economy, et cetera, to expand businesses, et cetera, but they don't do that. And that has become the reservoir of hot money. So Larry Summers saying, well, gee, we should maybe go to negative interest rates to force people to spend. No, go to negative interest rates on excessive reserves and force the banks to lend. And... They're using the money for, you know, in the casino. That's what all these, they're getting caught on all this stuff from whale trades or whatever. Um, they use that money for speculating rather than for doing what they should be doing. This is why Glass-Eagle I was totally against. I mean, you, you, repealing that was, was doomed, absolutely doomed. I mean, banks are, are just, effectively acting like hedge funds, but they don't give you a piece of the profit. You only get their losses. Yep. They socialize the losses and privatize the profits, if there are any. Although the way the, the profits get socialized is when the government comes uh, knocking on their door saying, oh, you did this wrong, you did that wrong, uh, pay us this fine, Right. Well, that's what's happening now. These fines are starting to go up dramatically. They ne you never saw something like this before. And um, the government needs money, and they're all starting to say, hey, you know, give us a real piece of this action here. <laughs> uh, it's, it's really bribery. So you, you give them a billion-dollar fine, you don't get criminally charged. And uh, everybody's happy, you know, oh, I see, I paid a fine. Now, it's call it a bribe. That's basically what it is. Yeah, I'll or, give you a billion dollars, you leave us alone, you go away. Or hush money. Yeah, that's basically what it is. Um, so it's not really a fine, it's just payoff money. Yeah, it's just to get them off your back. It's like yeah, uh, the saying, Chinese merchants pay the triads. Hey, what about, uh, Martin, the Chinese said they're no longer going to stockpile currency reserves. What are they going to do instead? Are they going to start putting money in the stock market as well? Is that their plan? Oh, yes, they have been actually doing that. But um, they are, at this stage in the game, looking at, they understand what they have to do. And that is they have to start developing their domestic economy. They have to create a consumer base there. I mean, we're actually in 
negotiations with uh, an entity over there that you wouldn't even believe has 800 million clients. I mean, <laughs> it's just astronomical. Um, but they are really quite interesting that they understand what they're doing and they are moving more into the um, – not going to buy euros or yen or something like that. They have 3.6 trillion reserves. They really don't need much more, quite honestly. So they're going to start really trying to invest it domestically to expand the economy, create more of a consumer thing, so that way they'll have a solid economy by the time we get to about 2032. Mm-hmm. So they're looking at this from the long haul perspective. Yes, huh. Asia is very interesting. Um, whenever I do conferences or seminars and talk to clients over there, it's all long term. Mm -hmm. Over here, it's like, well, what can I make next week? <laughs> uh, it, you know, I got quarterly earnings I got to worry about. We're mm -hmm. extremely short-term in the West. Asia, it's all about long-term. I mean, Singapore actually puts out, you know, it, it's 20-year plan, and it sticks to it. Mm -hmm. Amazing. So it's a whole different uh, perspective on things. Huh? They understand cycles. They understand that it's part of their religion. Um, so what you find is really that they understand, uh, you know, there's a time to sell and there's a time to buy. That it's not linear, it doesn't always go up straight, and, and there's a cycle to everything. So that's just part of life. It's like we have seasons. And there isn't anything that doesn't have a cycle right down to your heart that beats. So... Um, that is largely how energy moves from one, you know, cell to another, from one place to another, like AC current and electricity can be transmitted further, DC current, sure. no. Yeah. So it, it, it's all pretty much the same thing. And, and so China is, is very wise. They, um, when I met there with Central Bank, I was completely shocked because everybody, instead of being bureaucrats, had to, to the people that are actually pulling strings, worked on dealing desks at the various banks in London, New York, and Tokyo. Mm -hmm. And so when I sit down with them, it's like they were actual traders, where you don't get that at any other central bank. Yeah, well, look at uh, the new head of the Fed. Uh, any thoughts about uh, Janet Yellen there? It's more or less all the same. I mean, um, the, we tend to reward career people in, in politics and and working for government. They, you, you cannot have people like this. In all honesty. Um, you have to have somebody that comes from the private sector that has seen both sides of the coin. And unless you do that, they've only said, well, you know, I'm the government, I can pass a law, and everybody has to do this. And go ahead and do it and see what happens. You know, you can pass a law, nobody can go over 55 miles an hour. Does it really work? Well, both um, theoretical and want to talk more up next about the metals markets, uh, where we're heading there, on the Financial Survival Network com, 1230 WBZT. Glad you did, and tell them Kerry sent you. And we're back on the Financial Survival Network com with a special interview with uh, Martin Armstrong, Kerry Lutz, 1230 WBZT. So, Martin, where are the uh, metals markets heading now? Uh, obviously, the trend for the future is inflationary, and they're going to start doing things based on what you said, eliminating uh, paying interest on the excess reserves held with the Federal Reserve. That There was something about that in the last Fed minutes. 
um, you know, velocity of money. They got to make that pick up to make things start happening, right? You know, it's it's a question. What you need is basically the psychology to change um, among the people again, uh, which I don't really see happening until the earliest is next year. That's what we've been we've been saying that uh, gold had to go down. Test you know, it, it was after 13 years up, it always goes down two to three years, and that's give you know was our minimum target, and that brings us into into early you know 2014. So um, there's a possibility you can extend further into 2015, but that's more. It will depend upon the price. Mm -hmm. Typically, when you look at markets, when they go down or up, they fool around with with whole numbers. They love that. So, like the Dow kept fooling around with 1,000 in 1966, 68, 74, 80, and finally broke through uh, in, in 85. But... This is the same thing. Largely, you have this 1,000 number in gold, which will be psychological more than anything. Mm -hmm. Typically, a market will come back and will retest its former high, and that would be 875 from 1980. But we're we're putting out a report on this, and we and when you chart gold in um, adjusted for inflation. The 1980 high is about 2300 bucks. So we never exceeded the 1980 high, which is why you're having this correction now. It was not a bull market, per se, as far as breaking out. Now, the, the Dow is just starting to break out, making new highs. Eventually, gold will have to do that. Okay, but... First, you come back, you retest the former highs, which could be anywhere from the low 1,000 range down to, uh, I would say, you know, 875 to, you know, low 900s. Once that takes place, then you'll, the same thing as you just saw in the Dow, everyone's saying, oh, it can't go any higher, this is it, you got to sell it. They, the majority always have to be wrong because that is the fuel that actually makes the market move. And when you see gold crack a thousand, all the headlines will be, that's it. Gold's done. It's finished. It will never go up again. It's going to go to 500 or 600. They'll be talking about it always moves exponentially like that. In Tokyo, when I was there, uh, and the Nikkei hit forty thousand, they go, "Yeah, but we're really going to a hundred. Mm -hmm. <laughs> sure. It's just it, it's just the way it is. And when you get to a major turn, it always goes exponential in expectations, and that is the key that you're there. So we're not there yet in metals, um, mm -hmm. and. You really can't be when when capital is confused, trying to figure out where it's going. It's starting to shift, and as this begins to move, you're seeing real estate popping up again, which we said should rally uh, into 2015. So it's been doing exactly what we had, you know, said would happen from the 2011 low. Um, when I put out some of this stuff back then, Barron's did an article on us and said, uh, gee, you know, in, in, back in 2000, Armstrong says it's going to go to new highs. We'll see what really happens. Well, here we are. Um, that's the way it is. It, the more you get the majority of people on the opposite side, that becomes the fuel. Right. At the bottom, what you'll see is a, is a, that's where a lot of shorts will come in. And it will be the shorts covering their, their positions, which will give you the initial rallies up, which should be, you know, generally fairly good. You know, you're probably looking at $50 rallies coming 
uh, when that begins. And then uh, the same thing at the top. Uh, when the Brady Commission had had called me for the 87 crash, <clears throat> the typical idea is we're going to find that person who who forced the market down and um, that's what this investigation is going to do. And I said to him, I said, look, uh, every investigation since 1907 has begun with this expectation of finding this giant position that overcomes the market and forces it down. Nobody's ever found one. And, in fact, every investigation always found everybody wrong. Mm -hmm. And um, the guy just looks at me and says, well, what makes it go down? I said, very simple. You run out of buyers. You scare the herd. You have everybody that has ever thought of buying is long. And what happens is the last longs start to bail out right away. So that's what a flash crash is. It's not a short position these people look for. It's all the longs trying to get out and there's no bid. So you get a flash crash. And the same thing will happen in reverse from the downside. It will go up because there's no more sellers. So once you get everybody short, you scare them. They then try to move up and there's no offers. So it will start rising exponentially. In, in the 87 crash, when it went down, fine, our model even had, we were like 10 basis points off of the, the price, and we got the time right. I looked at them at, at the, at the screens, and it said I could buy like a, a, a 200 call on the S&P. It was trading for pennies. Initially, I pick up the phone and I say, okay, fine, I'm going to buy as many as I can get. And only my experience saved me. And this year I was going to say, okay, fine, buy at the market. But then I said, no, put a limit on it. The next trade, going from a, a couple hundred basis points, was, was like 3,000. Why? Because the market makers withdraw. Mm -hmm. You go to sell a call option, um, and and you put in a price in at three thousand. All right, there's nobody else in the market. I come in, say buy at the market. I'm filled at three thousand. The next one could be two hundred. You know, this is the way it goes when you're at lows and highs. There's there's no liquidity. The market makers typically withdraw. Everybody's out trying to find the short or the long, and they can't. Because there's nobody with that kind of guts to do it. Mm hmm So, interesting. So, uh, <laughs> the madness of herds, huh? Pretty much. It, it is, um, <clears throat> there is a, an interesting book that I would recommend if you want to see about psychology. Of, it was um, Stanley Milgram. Obedience to authority. Yeah. Oh. And very interesting some of the studies he did. But just think about it. If he puts one, if you put one person on the street staring up into the sky, looking at absolutely nothing, people walk by and say, "Oh, he's crazy." Put five people out there, all staring at absolutely nothing, looking straight <laughs> up in the sky, and everybody will stop to see what it is they're looking at. Yeah. I've seen this, but I've seen it happen in Manhattan. Uh, we are times. hardwired for a lot of collective behavior, and mm -hmm. that's what markets are about. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 a fascinating study, and uh, I guess if you can find out where the herd's going to go and know what they're going to do before they do it, that's how you can make the money. Absolutely. That's why I say just look at the herd because what it has to be, 
just as you began this interview saying, gee, everybody was saying no, 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 that's the majority. I'm the guy saying no, it's going to go up. Who ends up being right? It's because the majority always has to be wrong. Because they're selling that high, they now have to cover their short positions, and that takes it through. And I've seen this, too, in the uh, sports book. Um, you know, not that it's uh, it got, it shares a lot of similarities to the stock market, but a friend of mine is a contrarian sports better, and he's right better than 70% of the time because when he sees a team that scored a lot of points for a lot of games in a row, and then he looks at a line that doesn't appear right, uh, he knows that they're not going to score a lot of points, and he makes the bet, and he's usually right. It's just amazing. It really carries forward in a lot of the uh, aspects of life, this contrarian yeah. theory. Dude, everything is cyclical. You can't always win. You know, One team cannot win absolutely every game. Um, I find it ironic that... You know, in, in politics, I mean, our computer model does um, political forecasts. And it, honestly, it's never been wrong. It, it was, but what the striking thing that comes from it is that the vast majority of these people, uh, presidents or whatever, what are they elected with? 52%, 53%. Nobody's ever got even 60. And I'm talking, I think FDR in 1932 only got 57. Mm-hmm. You know, but they stand up there like, oh, you know, everybody's behind me. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, they're not. Um, and it, it's very surprising, but you've got probably 40% of the people that are Republican, 40% of the people that are Democrat, no matter what you say, what evidence you show them, neither one will ever convert. Well, Then you have maybe 20% in between that are more independent thinkers. Mm-hmm. And of that, 5% seems, or you take it plus or minus, say 10%, those are the people that actually determine who will be the president. So everybody else should just stay home. If we could just figure out who those five percent are, everybody else stays home and let those guys uh, vote for the president. <laughs> Honestly, Ed, that's it, it's the way it goes because that's what that's what will happen. Um, you'll get the Republicans, you'll get the diehards, you know, Democrats. They will. I don't care what you show them. They will not change their mind. You know, it's a little different this time, this Obamacare thing, and I didn't, I didn't really get into political discussions with you because we're not about politics here, but this thing is, is a game changer in that it screwed over 100 million people, and those 100 million people are asleep, and they didn't even know it until about six weeks ago when... They started getting the cancellation notices, and they're going to continue getting them for the next year. I knew this thing because I actually read, I didn't read the law because I just have no patience to read these 2,000-page statutes anymore if nobody's paying me to read them. And But I read people who did read them, and I knew this was going to happen. And to talk to people and explain it to you that, this is what's going to happen in the year 2013. And they just look at you incredulously. But so many people are getting hit by this that, uh, you know, from the senior citizens that I hang out with at Starbucks to the guy who's working, uh, you know, for a bank, everybody is getting hit by it. So we're going to we're going to see a big change come up the next two elections, that is for certain. How it translates and whether it's going to be better, I don't make any predictions about that. But uh, somehow Well, our cycle... computer has been warning that, um, and you can see some of the, the charts on, on our blog, but we've you know charted third-party activity and we've had huge spikes uh, 
periodically. This one going into 2016 uh, should be the largest third-party type spike. And um, we have a, a chance of, of really messing things up here and, and changing the dynamics. But um, <clears throat> Obamacare is indicative of government. Yep. They cannot... Uh, honestly, if they had to give out life preservers on the Titanic and they had twice as many than they had passengers, they would still screw it up. <laughs> Everyone would still drown. <laughs> and they, they, they're impossible. They have the people that run this stuff, they honestly do not have any practical experience. Yeah, uh, um, we both expen experienced it firsthand, uh, dealing with these idiots, and uh, you know they just everything they turn a touch turns to garbage, and I, uh, it's just the, it, this is the logical uh, the logical conclusion of government Obamacare. Well, look, I mean, it, you know, we were just joking the other day because of the, uh, with my sister. When JFK actually came to New Jersey, I shook his hand. I didn't want to become president. Bill Clinton did. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, okay, fine. Nice. You know, I was, you know, too young. I wasn't that impressed because I had a thought that, oh, I shook his hand, so now I want to become president? No, I don't think so. <laughs> But um, some people just, that's all they want to do. They want that notoriety or that power. They're sociopaths is what it comes down to here, Martin. This is, yeah. they're so as soon as they get out of school, that's all they do. They yeah. go straight to government, and they never come out. Frightening. And, you know... Look, I mean, I could read every book on brain surgery. And I can memorize everything that's in the book. You want to be my first patient? <laughs> yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's simple as that. You know, sometimes you just need experience, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, just, it's just a fascinating thing to behold, the, the way the whole thing has gone. And I venture to say you knew what was going to happen with it. You knew exactly what was going to happen with it. Any thinking person knew the way this was going to turn out, uh, except the one thing you didn't know was actually how bad and how fast it was going to blow up. I didn't know how fast it was going to blow up. I did know that website was never going to work properly to the point where the in you're not going to know if you have insurance going through that website or not. You know, that's a scary phenomena, whether not knowing you signed up through healthcare.gov, whether you're going to have insurance or not. But I signed well, up on the I signed up on healthcare.gov. Of course, I have insurance. Well, sorry, sir. Uh, according to our records, you don't. What do you do then? <laughs> well, I think they got thirty-two thousand people that signed up and two hundred thousand people that got cancellations so far, or something like that. Yeah. Oh, it's it's millions. I um, mean. Uh, and, it's just the whole yeah. thing is a joke. It's, it's just it is a joke, and and honestly, uh, when I go to Starbucks, I see a lot of young kids there. Yeah, and they say they'd rather pay the eighty five dollars a month. <laughs> yeah, well, the, those kids generally aren't going to get health insurance anyway because they think that they're invincible. You know, they call them the invincibles. When you're uh, twenty two years old. You're not thinking about, uh, you know, type 2 diabetes. You're not thinking no. about heart disease or cancer or anything else. You're thinking about having a good time, having fun, trying to get a job, trying to pay your damn student loans. You're not thinking about health insurance. Well, it, the government doesn't know how to yeah. structure anything. Yeah. One of the classic examples was New Zealand. They passed a law that if a girl <clears throat> got pregnant and did not know who the father of the child was, the state would take care of her, including giving her a house. Uh. 
suddenly they ended up with the highest proportion of women in the West, <laughs> Western society that had no clue who the father of the child was. <laughs> Um, and the guy was actually there, and he would just jump out the back back window when when the social worker came. <laughs> it drove interest rates the uh, the national debt up to twenty five percent, and they finally had to break. You know, it was bankrupting the country. Yeah. You know, it sounds nice, but you don't understand how people are going to react, and um, that's simply the way it is. Yeah. And um. You make it like that, and and that's what you're going to get, you know. <laughs> and we got it, boy. We got it in spades, and uh, it's a little scary, especially if you have something wrong with you, and you're in the middle of one policy, and you can't afford the next. But uh, hey, Martin, uh, we we find you at ArmstrongEconomics.com, right? Correct. All right, and of course, uh, in the show notes to this interview, we'll have a link to your site. And don't forget, go to financialsurvivalnetwork.com, sign up for our newsletter. We had something on fracking this this uh, last newsletter. Uh, there's a revolution taking place. They keep saying, we're running out of oil, Martin. We're running out of oil. Those wells in North Dakota, they're just going to run out. And leave it to man to come up with a new technology that will greatly prolong the lifespan of even those fracked wells to the point we're going to have more oil than we know what to do with. So, uh, you know, it's just the nature of things that these so-called experts really, especially when they're working for the government, never know what the heck they're talking about. Well, wasn't it Malthus who basically said we would all be dead by now? Yeah, <laughs> and how long ago did he say you? that? <laughs> I think it was in the 1700s. Right? Yeah, so it shows what he knew, right? And how many yeah. billion people ago was that? So, hey, Martin, always a pleasure. We'll talk with you again soon. Enjoy the holiday, and we'll talk to you after the first of the year as the Dow marches in X 